Okay, I got it for you. Okay. So within the blood system, blood cell production, which is also known as hematopoiesis, begins in the embryonic development within the primitive yolk sac. So when the baby, the fetus is forming, the cells are actually being produced in the yolk sac. And then later as the fetus matures, the, de the development of the liver takes place, then the cells will start to be produced within the liver. And then later on, as the infant matures and over time at their childhood, through adulthood, then the cell production moves to the bone marrow. CD34 pluripotent stem cells give rise to the earliest myeloid and lymphoid line. The stem cells can repopulate the bone marrow after any sort of injury or any sort of lethal radiation exposure or um, this is usually due to something like a bone marrow transplant where they want to completely wipe out the cell production that is abnormal to put in new normal cells. The myeloid progenerators differentiate into colony forming cells of the Rithward line. So this is just a diagram to kind of show you that those cells will decide at some point, depending on the need, as far as to what they will be, either the erythrocyte, red blood cell line, the platelet line, your granulocytes, or your monocyte and lymphocyte cell line. <coughs> the main function of your erythrocytes is to carry oxygen to the cells throughout your body. So your cells need oxygen to live. If your cells are not getting the oxygen, then that tissue will start to die. So you can see this in like diabetic patients where the cell circulation doesn't go to the extremi extremities like it should, mostly the feet. And this is where you will see when diabetics aren't getting good blood flow due to this constriction of the vessels and the damage of the vessels from the diabetes that the tissue within the feet will start to die and then you can see diabetics start to have to get to a point of cell necrosis within the toes and gradually move up to the leg and sometimes require amputation. So those red cells are transporting the oxygen in a chemi chemical combination of hemoglobin, which can be abbreviated either of those two ways. And then the hemoglobin in the blood is measured of its capacity to carry oxygen. So that's what we're looking for when we're looking at the hemoglobin is the capacity to carry oxygen. To combine with and transport oxygen, the hemo hemoglobin molecule must have a certain combination of heme which contains iron and globulin. The red cell begins as a nucleated red blood cell in the bone marrow, which is what we um, saw a little bit on the last slide. It didn't really show the, the nucleated portion, but it begins as a nucleated cell. And then as it matures, then the size of the cell will start to decrease and the nucleus becomes a little bit denser and smaller. And then finally it is released from the red blood cell. And then the red cell itself becomes a, con a biconcave disc. So it's got a little bit of indention on both sides, sort of like a donut. And you can see that in, depicted in these pictures. So like I mentioned in the last slide, as the cell matures, it starts out as a ribblast this nucleated cell. And as it matures, it starts to get a little smaller. The nucleus gets a little bit more condensed and it goes through various stage, stages of development until you get to the stage here. Sometimes you can see this in the red blood cell um, when you're doing a differential count for a normal slide review. 
occasionally you can see these um, one or two, but once you start getting an abundant number, that can indicate something else. So it's not abnormal to see an occasional nucleated red blood cell. These are abnormal to start seeing these. But once that nucleus is released from inside that red blood cell, then you'll get what is a reticulocyte stage where it has just released, it's got a little bit of the reticulum left, and then we move on to a mature red blood cell. So the reticulocyte is the stage just after that nucleus has been released. So it's, <coughs> excuse me, it contains a fine basophilic reticulum which is still some RNA remnants left with inside that cell. And as the cell continues to mature, then you'll, it'll get rid of those and the cell size will become a little bit smaller. So normal lifespan of a red blood cell is about 120 days. The bone marrow is constantly releasing new cells every day because as you can see, if they're living only 120 days, if it just waited to 120 days to make new cells, then anything that you might have lost or that would be an abundant production of cells at one time, which could potentially um, put you in a situation where you don't have enough cells on that 120 day mark. So your body is constantly producing cells for whatever you may need. The concentration of red blood cells and the measurement of packed volume red blood cells, which is also known as a microhematocrit or hematocrit, are important in laboratory me methods, measurements for the detection of anemia or the over overproduction of red blood cells. So there are certain disease states where you can produce too many red cells, which can cause issues as well. Erythrocyte formation and destruction. So new red cells are formed in the bone marrow. Cells released into circulating, they're released into the circulating blood. And then as the cell wears out, the reticular endothelial system starts to break down. Then the proteins from them go into protein storage pool, which can be used again in the bone marrow to produce new cells. So the iron, once it's broken down, the iron is uh, recycled as well, goes into an iron storage pool, and then is reused in the bone marrow to produce new cells. And any kind of waste products that are left out of that will be excreted in the form of bowel, and it will be removed in the feces and the urine. So if anybody ever tells you you're not recycling, then you are recycling. You're just not recycling in a way to help the environment. So. You're always recycling. So the heme molecule itself, um, the hemoglobin synthesis structure and function, the hemoglobin, which is iron containing portion that combines with globulin is the protein portion. And it forms an active form of hemoglobin that is ready to transport oxygen. Now I'm not requiring you to understand this. When you get to hematology, um, most of you are in it, then you'll study this in a little bit more detail. But I just want you to be familiar that there is a hemoglobin molecule and that hemoglobin molecule re requires four heme groups, which is this group right here depicted in A. And so those combine together um, with the heme molecules and the globulin and you have the four globulins. And when all of that combines together, along with the iron, that gives you your hemoglobin. The iron is essential for the primary function of the hemoglobin molecule, which again is to carry oxygen. So it's very important to understand that that's what that purpose is. If iron is lacking, then you get a result of anemia because the hemoglobin is not formed sufficient in a sufficient quantity. The molecule fully saturated with oxygen 
It has four oxygen molecules per hemoglobin molecule. It's called oxyhemoglobin. So oxyhemoglobin is what's responsible for carrying oxygens from the lungs to the tissue. And of course, you understand the circulatory system that the blood goes to the lungs, picks up oxygen, releases carbon dioxide, circles through the body, distributes the oxygen, picks up any kind of um, any kind of waste, um, the carbon dioxide from where the oxygen is used from the tissue, and then it transports it back to the lungs and does the exchange again. Now, hemoglobin itself can have some variations to it. Um, normal hemoglobin for an adult has hemoglobin A and hemoglobin A2. And of course, you'll get into this more within hematology and some in chemistry. Uh, fetal hemoglobin, hemoglobin F is the primary hemoglobin for a fetus or a newborn. So newborns have a large amount of still the fetal hemoglobin before they actually start making the A and A2. So if you were to do a hemoglobin electrophoresis on an infant, you should see a lot of hemoglobin F. On an adult, you should see a lot of hemoglobin A and A2. Some of your abnormal hemoglobin variants are hemoglobin S, hemoglobin C, hemoglobin SC. So hemoglobin S, C, and SC is typically what um, people refer to as sickle cell disease, although hemoglobin S is the only one that actually produces the cells that look like sickles. So this cell here that's kind of curved, this is a sickle cell. If um, what happens with those abnormal hemoglobins within that cell, it causes the cell to lose its flexibility. So when it goes through capillaries and various parts of the body, when it squeezes through, it's unable to maintain its shape and to spring back. So you get a little abnormal shape here. So when those cells go through um, normal circulation, they get hung because they don't have that flexibility and then they'll kind of pull up together. The hemoglobin derivatives, um, when you have sufficient quantity of hemoglobin uh, present within circulating blood, um, everything's fine. But if you have a lack of it, um, you have epoxy or a lack of hemoglobin. And the sign of this can be the cyanosis, which is the bluish discoloration on the skin, mucous membranes. Um, so if somebody's lacking oxygen, you may start to see the blue lips. The oxyhemoglobin and um, reduced hemoglobin is an example of this. And then something you might be familiar with is carboxyhemoglobin um, when someone has carbon monoxide poisoning. So if the correct hemoglobin is not circulating, then this is where you could come into the lack of oxygen and causing the cyanosis, which is the bluish discoloration. The reference range for um, hemoglobin and peripheral blood can vary depending on age and gender. And we say reference range, that refers to the normal range for the average person of a particular age group or gender. And sometimes even race can play into some of those. It can vary based on different things like altitude, um, the normal hemoglobin for individuals living in a different in a higher altitude is different than those living at sea level. And this is one of those things that kind of goes back to um, the QC the QC lesson that was covered several weeks back referring to developing normal reference ranges for your population. So different areas have different populations. So the reference ranges have to be studied and adjusted for that particular area. And as people get older, then you can start seeing a slight decrease in hemoglobin levels, um, especially after age 50. 
when the hemoglobin value is below normal, the patient is said to be anemic. So anemia itself um, and anemia circulating erythrocytes may be deficient in number and the total hemoglobin content per unit of blood volume, or it could be both. So it's not necessarily, if you say someone is anemic, it's not necessarily that um, they always have um, not enough red blood cells. It could be just that the red blood cells that they do have doesn't have enough hemoglobin content. So an increase in hemoglobin can be seen in polycythemia and in newborns. So when newborns come out, they typically have a higher reference range of red blood cells. And then polycythemia viria um, is an overproduction of red cells. And so sometimes you can see that with people who smoke, um, that they will have a higher hemoglobin than people that do not smoke. Leukocytes are your, red, your white blood cells, the formed elements of blood that go through uh, developmental stages. Uh, all cells mature. They are able to move through the sinusoids of the marrow because of a de decreased overall cell size and decreased number, decreased nuclear cytoplasm ratio and increased flexibility and mobility. So as the cells mature, your white blood cell line, they get smaller, just like the red cell line when they, they decrease in size as they mature. So that makes them able to cross the sinusoids a little bit better. Normal peripheral blood cells include lymphocytes, basophils, basophils eosinophils, segmented neutrophils, monocytes, and occasionally a band neutrophil. Each cell type has a normal lifespan and function. Normally only mature cells are seen within the peripheral blood smear. If you see immature cells, this could indicate certain disease, disease states or a shift to the left. So when we refer to a shift to the left, um, the old way before the computer age, and we started putting the ability to do differentials on the computer, we had these counters that were sort of like a typewriter where the old style typewriter where you would push the little buttons and it would click over to a number so it keep clicking and going up higher when you have your fingers on the counter you most people would use their left hand so you would have four fingers on the first four little keys, and then you would count your normal cells, seg, lymph, mono, EO. I can't remember Zach, Which, what was the order? Seg, lymph, mono, EO? It was, um, it was seg, lymph, mono. And then yeah. the, the rest is because they're not as many. So. <clears throat> yeah, so you would have to shift over to the next four keys. So you would shift to the left to get your immature cells in there. So that's where the term shift to the left came from. And uh, I will show you the counter when we go to the lab. Uh, we have some of them. Okay, good. Yeah, we don't have any, so I can't show students. <laughs> um, your lymphocyte morphology, uh, Leukocytes are large, they're more complex than your red blood cells in appearance, and they have that nucleus, and that nucleus is surrounded by cytoplasm. And then you have your five white blood cell types. So at the top, in the very top row going across, you have segmented neutrophils, then the row under that, they're bands. So the top row, you can see the nucleus is segmented. You have all these little clumps. So typically you have um, four, four clumps or so, sometimes less, but somewhere around that number. Then you move to the band where you can see a solid sausage type shape to it. Then we move down to our lymphocytes where you can see 
a nucleus with a little bit of cytoplasm. Sometimes when you get to an atypical form, it get a little bit more cytoplasm. Your monocyte will have a larger nucleus that's lobulated. It has different indentions. And then it also has a larger cytoplasm and sometimes it can have vacuoles. Your eosinophil looks a lot like a segmented neutrophil with the exception of these large pink granules. And then your basophil has the large dark purple, blackish purple looking granules. <coughs> when you examine the leukocytes, you are looking for the nuclear chromatin pattern the shape of the nucleus, the size, and the number of the nucleoli, if there are any present. And of course, your mature uh, cells in the peripheral blood shouldn't have the nucleoli. You're looking for any sort of cytoplasmic in inclusions, and you're also looking at the ratio of the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So the nuclear chromatin pattern, you're looking at the nucleus itself to see does it look like a checkerboard? Does it look lacy? What kind of description can you put to you how this looks? When you talk about the shape, is it indented? Is it in segments? Is it large, smooth, smooth edges, complete circle? When you look at the size and the number of the nucleoli, how big is it? Does it take up most of the cell? that goes into the nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. Is it more nucleus than it is cytoplasm? So when we say cytoplasm, we're looking at everything surrounding this nucleus, this bluish area here. Does it have any kind of inclusions in the cytoplasms? Are there granules? Are there vacuoles? Are there um, anything like um, abnormalities inside of this cytoplasm? Granulocytes are leukocytes that come from the myeloid series of cell development. So once you get past that stem cell and it goes to a myeloid series, then all of your granulocytes come from this series. And this is gonna include your neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, because they have specific granulations within their cytoplasm. Your monocytes are classified as myeloid cells and they have nonspecific granulation. Your lymphocytes come from the lymphoid line and they are, um, they also contain nonspecific granulation. Not always, but occasionally. So talking about the granulocyte line, so we said granulocyte, it has granules in it. So you see these little polka dot things here, that's your granules. Normally mature, they, these cells for your neutrophils normally mature in the bone marrow and they go through the stages of myeloblast, promyelocyte, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, band, segmented neutrophil. I'm not expecting you to know all of these and the difference in them. You'll get more detail in that when you get to hematology. These are the most numerous of the granulocytes. They make up about 59% of the leukocytes within the peripheral blood. Your range can go from 35 to 71, somewhere in there, in there is normal. They usually <coughs> are lob they usually have a lobular nucleus, um, which takes up a small portion of the cell. The nuclear chromatin is coarse and clumps, it stains a deep purple. And the nucleus nuclear membrane is distinct, it has no nucleoli. Um, that is visible within your nucleus. You can't see any nucleoli here. The abundant cytoplasm is colorless, faintly pink. It contains the small um, granules inside of it and they are just spaced throughout the cell itself. The role of the neutrophil is to fight and destroy bacteria. So what I want you to know and understand about neutrophils is that they go through a maturation process that they, what they look like. So just be able to see a picture, know what a normal neutrophil looks like. 
and also that what its purpose is that its purpose is to destroy bacteria so occasionally you can get um, in the peripheral blood of someone normal you can see an occasional band neutrophil so it's not unusual to see a few if you start seeing a lot then that can indicate a problem it is the band neutrophil is a little bit younger a little bit more immature and of course it looks like the segmented neutrophil except that the nucleus shape is a little bit different so it's going to look more like a sausage or a band so like I said, if you see an increased number, this is significant. Generally an increased white blood cell count um, will result from an increase in an absolute number of neutrophils present in the blood called neutrophilia. And it's usually accompanied by a shift to the left. So seeing these bands, which means you'd have to shift over to count it then that's where shift to the left would come from. You're starting to see some immature forms. Neutropenia is a decrease in the absolute count. So when we say absolute, meaning overall count out of all the cells you count, um, that is the portion that it's too many of or too little of the neutrophils. Another granulocyte is this eosinophil. And of course it too goes through that maturation, maturation line of starting with the malocyte and then it progresses into a normal eosinophil. <coughs> it's gonna resemble a segmented neutrophil with the exception that these right here the cytoplasm is going to have all of these um, large granules here that stain a red, orange, pinkish color. And when you see an increase in these, it's usually associated with um, allergic type conditions, drug reactions, sometimes parasitic infections. So when I see the pink, I think of an allergic reaction. And what do we associate with needing when you have an allergic reaction? So usually when you have an allergic reaction, you take Benadryl. So classically, Benadryl is seen in a pink bottle or a pink peel. If you get regular Benadryl, sometimes the off-name Benadryls will um, make it pink as well. So that's where I associate the neutrophils, I mean the eosinophils with the pink color and the allergic reaction. Eosinopenia is a decreased number and this can be seen with hyperadrenalism. Monocytes they again go through a stage of development, starting with the monoblast all the way to the mature monocyte. This is a defense mechanism against microorganisms. So it's not uncommon if someone has an infection to see where it has actually engulfed bacteria. And occasionally if it's misbehaving, you can see where it has actually engulfed a red blood cell. The nucleus is large, it is usually indented, kind of folded around in there. And the cytoplasm itself is kind of a blue-gray color. And sometimes you can see very fine ezrophilic granules. These are motile, they phagocytize cells, and they, um, these will not die after they go through the phagocytic um, process. So they'll eat the cell, eat the bacteria and basically destroy the bacteria. So that's what their purpose is. <laughs> lymphocytes, it's about 34% of the lymphocytes in the normal blood. They too go through the development, starting with lymphoblasts all the way up to mature lymphocytes. And these cells are responsible for directing the immune response within the body. 
um, if it's most of them circulate between the blood, the organs, and the lymphatic tissue. So your lymph nodes is where you will see a lot of your lymphocytes as well. Lymphocytosis is an increased number, and this is usually associated with viral infections. So if someone gets um, mono, you can see an increase in the lymphocytes, which is confusing. When you're first learning about monocytes, you think, um, okay, monocytes, you'll see it with mono, but it's actually your lymphocytes that will be present during um, a mononucleosis infection. So you can have two sizes, the smaller, more normal size, like we just saw, and then you can have a little bit larger um, size, which is considered a little bit atypical. Small lymphocytes can go undergo transformation and then they move into the reactive or atypical or variant or reticular lymphocytes. So those are some of the names for this larger looking lymphocyte. The overall size of the small one and the overall size, overall size of the large one. So you can see those in comparison um, along with the nucleus cytoplasm ratio. And the nucleus is typically round or oval. It's light blue, sometimes depending on the size of the cytoplasm, you can see the little azrophilic granules. And then we have the thrombocytes or the platelets. So platelets are produced in the bone marrow <coughs> and are essential part of blood clot clotting mechanisms. So they act as a plug anytime you have any sort of wound and then they will release any kind of factors that are necessary for clotting. They do not have a nucleus and they are not an actual cell, but they do come from that cell line. Um, they are portions of cytoplasms that have been pinched off from a megakaryocyte and then they're released into the bloodstream. Um, mature platelets are colorless bodies about 1.5 to 4 micrometers in diameter. Um, they're round, ovid, they'll have a variety of shapes depending on what they've got going on. Um, and when they stain, they are colorless to pale blue. Um, they're colorless to pale blue to purple, just depending on how your stain is. Um, but you can see those here in this image. And when you're looking at them on the slide, sometimes they look like somebody's just stained some cotton or something and thrown it against the slide. <coughs> So in hematology, some of the procedures that you do is a CBC. Your CBC is going to consist of hemoglobin hematocrit, um, red blood cells with morphology, a white blood cell count with the differential platelet estimates. Um, you also get your red blood cell indices within the CBC, which is your MCV, MCH, MCHC. And these are part of what you can look at, use to look at on your printout when you do a um, CBC to kind of help gauge what your red blood cell population is going to look like. Then you can also do a reticulocyte count and you can also do a, a SED rate, um, ESR or SED rate. So your tube types that you're going to use for hematology, pretty much always EDTA. Um, the only time there's anything heparin, and you probably will not use heparin at any point, um, unless maybe you work at a physician's office for, um, you probably won't use heparin for hematology um, unless you're doing a spun microhematocrit with the tiny little slender tubes that look like a tiny little straw 
those are coated with heparin on the inside of those. So it, it's possible that you could use them then. Um, you do for hematology one, you'll do a spun hematocrit. So if you do it from a finger stick, you would use the heparin tube. If you're just taking it from a tube, you could just do a regular um, micro hematocrit tube that's not coated with heparin. And then sodium citrate is what is in the special tubes for sed rate. So there are a couple of different types of methods for sed rates, but there are some methods that require the specific um, ESR tubes to be collected. And then occasionally um, when you're in heme one or two, you may learn a little bit about um, patients that react to the EDTA. So they will give some abnormal results for their platelet count. So you might have to use a sodium citrate tube to get an actual platelet count and do some corrections for um, those particular patients. So we do see that occasionally within hematology. If you're working in a large lab, like a hospital lab, you're gonna see it quite often. Um, physician's office lab, you may not see it that often. Um, i just kind of show you, again, um, you can see this when a tube is spun down, you can see it with a micro hematocrit tube. When you do a hematocrit, a spun hematocrit. So just a reminder of those different parts. <coughs> you have your plasma up top. This little layer right here is your Buffy coat and then your red cells will be at the bottom. So when you do a micro hematocrit, you're measuring your red cells. This buffy coat right here contains your white blood cells and your um, platelets. Oops. <coughs> so when you're, <coughs> excuse me, when you're getting specimens for hematology, some of the things that can interfere, of course, is always your normal things like um, IV contamination, um, if the sample's clotted, if the sample's hemolyzed. If it's IV contamination, then it's gonna dilute your sample out. So your results aren't valid. If it's clotted, your clotting factors and your platelets are going into making that clot. So if you're running the CBC from a clotted sample, then your platelets are going to be abnormal. Your red cells count as abnormal. Well, it's not necessarily going to be abnormal, but it's not going to be um, true results. It's not going to be what that patient is because your platelets are hung up in the clot. Your, um, your red cells are getting hung up in the clot. You've got white blood cells or that are getting hung up in the clot. So that's going to decrease your count numbers. If it's hemoglobin, hemolyzed, then that hemoglobin, those cells have been damaged, they've ruptured open, so that hemoglobin content is not gonna be accurate as well. So if you get samples that are clotted or hemolyzed, you run them on an analyzer, you're gonna have to be able to recognize some things like your indices and things like that. Um, results looking abnormal, learning things like checking the tube to see if it's clotted, see if it's hemolyzed before you send those results out. So those are all things that you'll learn when you're in the hematology course of things to look for before you send results out. <coughs> Your hemoglobin measurement um, there's goes through hemoglobin cyanide method. It can go through an automated hemoglobinometry, or it can also be like a point of care hemoglobin assays where these are chemical measurements or um, a light type measurement where it uses light. Your hematocrit, which is also known as a pack cell volume. Um, these it can be a macroscopic observation where you do that spun hematocrit 
what you are doing in your hematology one class, you'll get to do that. It could be, um, it could be a calculation. Um, it's several methods, just depending on the manufacturer, the analyzer of how they do that measurement for hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, the blood cell counts, so when you're counting your white blood cells, your red blood cells, and your platelets, um, different manufacturers use different methods. There are sometimes electronic counting devices um, where it does electrical impedance, um, where it uses a light type measurement, laser measurement. So there are a lot of different um, methods out there. It's going to vary by manufacturer. But the main thing that you should understand about the analyzers doing the counts is they're counting thousands and thousands and thousands of cells. That helps get away from human error. It provides a little bit more accurate result. But of course, there are situations where things can interfere. So the counts aren't always accurate. That's where it's going to be your job to learn how to recognize those things and learn how to report out an accurate result based on other criteria. And what's so funny is um, you'll run a sample through an analyzer and you send the results out. Everything's normal, the differential's normal. And you'll have a doctor that calls and says, um, I want you to do a manual differential. So they actually want you to take it, make a slide, look at it under the microscope. And you do the manual differential, it's the exact same thing. And physicians sometimes, especially some of the ones who have been in practice for many years, they like somebody to look at it. And you try to explain to them that this analyzer is counting thousands and thousands and thousands of cells. I'm looking at a hundred cells. So which one do you think is more accurate in visualizing all of those cells? The analyzer looking at thousands or me looking at a hundred. So um, you will experience that in your career where you have physicians that don't believe the analyzer. And then sometimes you have um, things with patients that come up that it'll run through the analyzer three or four days in a row. It never detects anything. And then all of a sudden one day it detects one thing and you look at it under the microscope and they've got a parasite in there. So the techs aren't always 100% accurate. The machines aren't always 100% accurate. But you're going to learn when you're in hematology ways to help detect some of those errors. So this is just um, an example of some of the methods with like the electrical impedance or the optical detections where <coughs> when those cells are going through that analyzer, it's measuring things like size, it's measuring the content within the cell, is there a nucleus, what does the nucleus look like? And it puts those into a category and that's how it counts the percentage of eosinophils and neutrophils and lymphocytes. And so then it puts it in um, a category. So all of these little dots would be a particular category that it's putting it in or with red blood cells, it's measuring the size. So it says, well, uh, most of the cells are this size. So you can see that it's just putting all of them right there in that category. And then this would be considered, you know, a normal range here. And you'll learn about this in more detail within hematology. So I'm not expecting you to know it. Just wanted you to see, and kind of get an idea of how it works. Your reticulocyte count, You'll also get an opportunity to do this manually in hematology. So again, those reticulocytes, we're looking for the cells that have that RNA left inside of them. They have gotten rid of the nucleus. Um, a high reticulocyte count could indicate that the body is attempting to meet an increased need for red blood cells. So where, what would be a situation for the need for more red blood cells? So if you've had some sort of injury, um, something where you've lost a lot of blood volume, 
let's just say um, a female that has just given birth, her hemoglobin drops because she had a bleed um, during delivery. And so as her hemoglobin has dropped, then the physician's got to make a decision. Okay, she's dropped. She's right on the edge of being critical. Do we want to give her some blood cells and introduce her to an abnormal cell while she's potentially going to be breastfeeding? Or do we want to hold off and wait? So what they might do is do a reticulocyte count to see, okay, is she producing red blood cells and is she producing it rapidly? So if a reticulocyte's done and yes, she's got a high number of reticulocytes in circulation, then we know that she's producing. So she's going to bounce back. It's just going to take her a little bit of time. But if she's not producing reticulocytes, then maybe we need to consider giving her some red cells. Um, so typically adults are only going to have a few. Newborns are going to have more reticulocytes. Why? Well, because their body is at a point where it's going to have to start producing cells on its own, getting its own oxygen. It's been used to mom supplying oxygen for the past nine months. So it's time for a baby to start kicking in, making some red cells. So you do want to see a high reticulocyte count in a newborn because you want to make sure that they're able to produce their own cells. <coughs> a set rate. Um, a SED rate you'll also get to do in hematology one. And so what a SED rate is looking for is an indication of some sort of inflammatory process. So it could be autoimmune disorders. It could be um, arthritis. It could be something like an infection. And so the patient is in an inflammatory response. And what you're looking for is how quickly these cells settle out. So you'll look at, um, depending on the test method, most of them, something like this would be an hour. You put the, mix the cells in this little container, put this long slender tube in that looks kind of like a pipette, press it all the way down until it fills up. And then after an hour, you're going to read the level at which the red cells have settled to. So anything depending on male or female, I think males is maybe 10 or 15 as the normal range and women is like 15 or 20. And if it's above that, then it would be considered abnormal. So the physician can kind of use this to gauge the inflammatory process. This goes back to your indices that we spoke about earlier. Um, where you could use this MCV, MCH, and MCHC, which kind of gives you an indication um, along with your RDW of um, what the morphology of the cells is going to look like. So your MCV is the volume within the red cell itself. So if you have a higher MCV, then you know the volume of that cell is a little bit more. So when it's measuring that cell, it's measuring in femtoliters. So a larger red cell would give you a larger volume. So you would know that when you look at the cell under the microscope, you should expect to see some cells that have a larger volume. <coughs> when you're looking at a peripheral blood smear, um, you're going to first use um, a drop of blood. So it could be from a finger stick or it could be from a tube. And you're going to put that drop of blood onto a slide and you're going to push it across the slide to make um, a feathered edge. And that feathered edge is what you're going to look at. So when you guys do hematology lab for um, this course in a couple of weeks, I think April 1st maybe is your lab date. Um, you're actually going to look at that feathered edge um, and you're going to look at the slide and look at some of these different cells that we've talked about. Making the slide you will do in hematology too. So you'll get some practice doing that. You'll make a lot of slides in your career. So that's, that's a technique that you'll have to tweak. So you'll get to work on that um, in hematology. So looking at a blood smear, um, when you start off, you're going to start off on low power and you're going to get to practice this in a couple weeks. 
you're, when you're looking at low power, you're looking to see the overall, overall quality of the slide. You're looking at the feathered edge to see if there's any platelet clumps around there, to see if there's any parasites, and just basically to find where you're going to start looking at and doing your differential count. When you switch to high dry, um, <coughs> at this point, you're going to do some estimates, red blood cell estimates, white blood cell estimates. And then you're going to scan um, for anything that might look abnormal as well. So again, any kind of platelet clumps, anything like that. Um, for HEM1, typically you would be, have already been in the lab working on some diffs, but I know with COVID things have kind of been shifted a little bit. So you've been um, doing some diffs online. But if you were working with the microscope in the lab, this is the process you'd go through. And then oil immersion. And remember, um, when you get in lab and you're looking at these slides, once you put the oil on, you cannot go back to your high dry, your 40X. So once you move to that white lens, do not circle back to that blue lens. Your oil immersion, you're going to examine um, your morphology of your cells, your, you'll do a platelet estimate, and you will also do your differential count. So you'll count 100 white blood cells, and then you tell how many of those are neutrophils, lymphocytes, etc. Now in lab, we're not going to actually do the count because that takes a lot of practice, but you will have the opportunity to look for some of these cells that we've talked about. So when you're looking at morphology for your red blood cells, um, you're looking for variations in the cell. So normal chromic means it's normal in color. Hyperchromic meaning it has more of the color than it should. You're, you don't have this little central polar area right here where it's um, a little bit lighter. So if it's hyperchromic, it's the whole cell is going to be pink and it's going to be a little bit darker of a pink. Um, if it's hypochromic, it does not have enough of this color. So you're going to see a lighter pink shade. You're going to see um, a larger, wider area here. Um, you can also get polychromasia, which is more of a purple color. So this is what we're looking for when we're looking at um, a cell potentially being a reticulocyte. That purple color is the staining of that RNA, um, which is giving it that purple color there. You're also looking for variations in size. So the cytosis is size. If we're having um, a lot of various shapes, then we're looking at the perkylocytosis. If we're looking, we're also looking for variations in the structure, we're looking for any kind of inclusion, and we're looking for any sort of artifacts or any kind of abnormal distribution in the cell patterns, or they all stuck together. And then we're also looking for any sort of nucleated red blood cell that may be there. So again, you're looking for variations, variations in size, are they small, are they normal, or are they large? And if you're having a variety, then that's considered an mesocytosis. Your variations in shapes, which is your pachylocytosis, um, do they have these abnormal projections? And I showed you a sickle cell earlier. Um, do they have weird looks to them? Do they look like teardrops? Are they squished in? So these are some of the things that you're going to learn about in hematology. And I'm not expecting you to know these. I just wanted you to be aware of what those terms are referring to. <coughs> for inclusions, what you're looking for is any anything like basophilic stippling or parasites. Um, my folks that are in microbiology, you've already seen this, so you should kind of have an idea what this is. That's your Bavasia. Um, You're looking for um, anything that's going to be abnormal within that cell. And there are some things other than the basophilic stippling and the parasites, but 
just want to give you a couple of examples. Um, and again, anemia is not a specific disease itself. It is condition resulting from something else. Platelets, when you're doing your platelet estimates, you're also looking for um, if there's any kind of weird changes, if they're clumped together, if they're really, really large, or if they're just not there at all. Sometimes you can look at a slide and not find any platelets. Um, well, you might find one or two, but you're not covering the whole slide. So it's, you're finding very little platelets. So on your high power, you're going to do your estimates. So you're looking for an average of six to 20 platelets per field. <clears throat> when you do your white blood cell count, again, you're counting 100 cells and you're looking for the amount of each population. So some of the terms, you know, I would like you to go ahead and get familiar with is neutrophilia increase or neutropenia, a decrease. So anytime there's philia, it's an increase, or penia, it's a decrease. For your granulocytes, you're looking for any kind of change within those. So do they have toxic granulation? Um, is there something in the nucleus? There are some cancers that can have variations to them and they can have things like our rods in the nucleus, different things like that that you're looking for to indicate cancer. And then something that's kind of different to look at is smudge cells. So if you see smudge cells, um, you know, they might look like kind of trash or an artifact to you, but it's an, actually a cell that has been smudged because it's so delicate when you're making your slide. So it actually looks like it's been kind of smeared on there. And so that's indicative of um, certain leukemias. So you want to be aware of those when you see those and not just skip over them. All right, so that is it for that. All right, any questions? We've been sitting here for a little bit, so you might want to take a quick break. I'm uh, just curious, are smudge cells considered white blood cells? Yes, they are white blood cells that have been um, been smudged. They've been kind of scooched, scooched across the slide. Okay, gotcha. Like, like, are, they all, like are, are they all like um, neutrophils or do, do they vary? They can vary, um, typically neutrophils, but what you can do to remedy that, um, which you'll learn about in hematology uh, second semester when you're looking at your abnormals, mm -hmm. is that when you're getting ready to make the slide, if you make a slide and you see smudge cells, then you can make another slide and you can take some of the um, sample and mix it in with albumin and then it, let that sit for a little bit and then make your slide using that mixture and that albumin helps keep those cells intact when you make the slide and then you can um, look at those cells and do those counts. Okay. All right. Do y'all need a break? No break? <coughs> I need a short break. I need something to drink. Okay, so we will move on to the COAG next. Oh, I see something in the chat. Did somebody have questions about platelet clumping? I'm not sure what he said. So I think that was like him kind of like, like, like commenting on the lecture of saying like, like some things are like, like he said, he, it, that was two different times. So he's, you were talking about something being not like incorrect, or whatever. And, and so he said, like, it means that like, it's not accurate. Okay, gotcha. I, I, I was just him agree, agreeing with you. He's not saying, like, he wasn't, I don't think he was disagreeing. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Maybe clarifying a term. Yeah, I yeah. Use. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
and you will find that. And I will tell you guys, when you're with us in lab, um, we're so used to lab lingo, working in the hospitals and things like that, that we'll use terms that sometimes we forget you don't know yet. So if you ever have a question about anything, interrupt us, let us know. And that's with all your instructors. Um, that was when I first started teaching. One of the hard things I had to learn is I would say something and the students are looking at me like, what are you talking about? And I finally realized, okay, they don't remember, they don't understand what I'm saying. So um, if we're using a terminology you don't understand, just let us know. Mm. That sounds good. All right, so. <coughs> All right, hemostasis, blood coagulation. So hemostasis is um, the cessation, cessation of blood flow from an injury or a blood vessel. So if you get a cut, this is hemostasis. If your body is functioning the way it should, then your body is supposed to stop that blood flow with that injury and put everything back in working order. If you were to get a cut and you did not have the mechanism to stop any of that blood flow, then your blood cells are just gonna continue to come out and eventually reach a point where you're gonna die. So there are some disorders <coughs> that people have with clotting and um, finding those disorders are important because you don't want a person to bleed to the point that they're passing out and they can't survive. <coughs> Hemostasis um, balances numerous independent coagulation factors that prevent bleeding. And it involves a complex interaction among the blood vessels, the platelets, the plasma coagulation factors, and um, any sort of inappropriate clotting. Um, so basically clotting when you shouldn't clot. The result of activation of the hemostatic system is the formation of the hemostatic plug or thrombosis um, at the site of the injury. So again, like I said, if there's an injury, your body needs to kick into action to stop that blood flow. Primary hemostasis results in the formation of a platelet plug. And then secondary hemostasis is where um, the formation of the clot um, because your coagulation factors have been activated and they start by forming this network that is going to um, block off that area and start to heal that injury. <coughs> um, once that injury, um, that cut has been blocked off and the clot has formed, then basically your body has to go through a process of repair and then removing that clot. Because if clots go to places they aren't supposed to, um, when you think about a stroke, that means that blood flow has been blocked off. When you block off blood flow, what did we talk about in the last hematology lecture? Your tissue's not getting oxygen. If the tissue's not getting oxygen, then the tissue and the cells start to die. So you don't want to block off blood flow. If you think about somebody that's had a stroke, um, if that blood flow stops to a certain part of the brain, then it creates injury that is hard to come back from, like um, paralysis on one particular side of the body or extremities, things like that. So once the clot forms after the body starts doing the repair, then <coughs> you need to go through a process of breaking that clot down because you want to be able to restore normal function and blood flow. <clears throat> the hemostatic mechanism is the entire process by which bleeding from an injured vessel is controlled and stopped. So it goes through a series of physical and biochemical changes that are initiated once that injury happens to that vessel or tissue. Um, 
which takes the um, the fluid of blood, <coughs> excuse me, the transformation of the fluid blood into a thrombus. So the fluid is like that plasma portion that we saw when those cells are separated. So within that, you have factors that are going to go in into creating that clot to seal off that injury. So you have three mechanisms. Which is, which is the extravascular effects, the vascular effects, and the intravascular effects. If the system is unbalanced, um, then <coughs> the bleeding or the thrombus, the clotting part of it, um, results from the defect in any phase of repair. So if you've got something like the vascular system itself is prone to injury, in other words, that vascular system is weak, those vascular walls are weak. You can see this with the elderly. They bruise really easy. Um, that vascular system is not what it used to be, or diabetics have problems with their vascular system, especially around the feet. Um, if the platelets are inadequate in number, you don't have enough platelets, or they don't function like they're supposed to, to be able to form that initial plug. A uh, fibrin clot mechanism could be inadequate, or the repair mechanism could be inadequate. So if any of those things are out of whack, that it can cause the whole system to be off balance. You can have excessive bleeding, which can result in also a combination of defects. <coughs> um, the functions of the platelet itself is to react to the injury. And when it reacts to the injury, it's going to form a plug and then um, once that plug is formed, then those platelets are going to activate and participate in the plasma coagulation. So those clotting factors that are in that plasma, they're going to recognize the signals sent by the platelets and then they're going to go into action. And then it's also going to maintain the endothelial lining of the blood vessels. So it's going to kind of act like a temporary Band-Aid. They will provide um, normal primary hemostasis and you really need an adequate number um, of functioning platelets to do this job. There are specific platelet function tests that can be done to make sure that the platelets are functioning like they're supposed to. So just because you have a normal amount of platelets does not mean that they function the way they're supposed to. There can be abnormalities in how the platelets function. And then there are certain medications, too, that um, alter the way a platelet functions. For example, aspirin. Um, you know, as people get older, they tend to do the regimen of an aspirin a day to prevent any kind of clots from a stroke. So the, platelet, the platelets itself have been affected by the aspirin, so they don't function the way they're supposed to. The formation of the platelet plug. So once you get an injury to the endothelial lining or the cells that are in that lining or that wall, the vessel or tissue, um, then the platelets will be exposed to the collagen that's within that lining. And when they're exposed to that collagen, that's when the platelets go into activation. So the platelets will start to change. They'll start sticking together. And then you'll start getting um, the fibronectin and the von Willebrand's factor that will come into play and help glue those platelets together. Then the platelets will start to change shape. They'll aggregate together with each other. So they start hanging out, having a block party. And then you have um, this mass group of platelets. They'll start growing. They're inviting all of their friends. And then they start forming the primary hemostatic plug. This kind of stabilizes, um, helps stabilize everything because you start getting these fibrin strands that will come into play. 
and then the plasma proteins will be activated by this point and that activation of those plasma proteins will start the process of forming a clot. <coughs> so the, pla the platelets will actually secrete substances that will promote the vascular repair, the vasoconstriction, and the platelet aggregation. Um, so once they're activated, these alter, alter, alterations result in the formation of receptors that will start binding the plasma proteins and the fibrinogen. Um, platelet factor three, it's a phospholipid, phospholipid that resides on or within the platelet uh, plasma membrane and the platelet factor three is required for the activation of some of the coagulation factors. Um, one function of this activation is to facilitate the formation of the thrombin. All of this in detail, you're gonna learn in hematology. Um, you guys probably, those of you taking heme are getting ready to be introduced to this in more detail. Um, the endothelium of the blood vessels is repaired and maintained with the help of all these products. Um, the vasoconstriction, you know, that blood vessel is going to kind of start tightening down to reduce blood flow to that area so that it's not all just coming out. It's going to kind of um, keep that blood from being as much coming to that particular area. <coughs> So if you have a quantitative um, platelet disorder, understand the difference between quantitative and qualitative. So what is quantitative? It is a quantity, so a number. Qualitative, um, which means the it's a letter. So it's positive, negative, how it works. Um, the quality of something. So understand the difference in quantitative and qualitative. So when we talk about something in quantitative, we're talking about in number. So platelets can be classified into quantitative um, as in thrombocytopenia, not enough, or cytosis, too many. Um, and then you can also have qualitative, which is the function, which is shown um, with those platelet function tests. Normal reference ranges um, is somewhere around 150 to 450. Now, just because you have under 150 does not mean that if you get a cut that you're just gonna bleed out. It just means you're a little bit low. So it might be something that needs to be monitored over time. Um, and again, thrombocytopenia, too little, thrombocytosis um, means you're above the range. So those terms, I do want you to be familiar with. Uh, I have a quick question. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so could you write that as what 1.5 times 10 to the 10th? No, it, I mean, I guess you could theoretically, but this is kind of the standard that's used. So if you just wish to switch that up to 1.5, a phys physician's going to see that. They're not really going to look at the times 10. Um, so that means that they're going to see that patient is having a 1.5 platelet count. Okay. Um, huh. So that then they may want to transfuse them, admit them to the hospital. Right. So times 10 to the ninth is the standard. So that's what you're going to um, see when you're working. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 and, uh, it, seems kind of, it seems kind of weird to write it that way. You know what I mean? Like, like normally, like the point of the <laughs> times 10 to the, you know, whatever, you know, is to make it shorter. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Um, some causes for decreased platelets, things like heparin therapy, alcoholic liver disease, um, 
So your platelets will play into your liver um, as far as platelet production, coagulation reduction, things like that. Um, so any issues with liver disease, you can see issues with clotting. Um, so disorders of production, disorders of destruction, or disorders of utilization, disorders of platelet distribution. Um, those can all be things that, um, those are your classifications of your platelet disorders. And you'll learn about some of this stuff in more detail. But if your platelets um, aren't functioning properly or you don't have enough, you can see that with various disorders of platelet, um, platelet diseases. Qualitative, um, <coughs> these are gonna be things like the quality of the platelet itself, its function, um, drug-induced, again, when I mentioned aspirin, plays into how the platelet works renal dysfunctions, uh, liver diseases, uh, acquired or inherited by von Willebrand's disease, and um, platelet dysfunction for plasma cell dys dysgrosis or something like multiple myeloma. Those are things that can affect how your platelets work. Um, once your platelets have been activated, then your plasma factors start to be activated. And then this is going to go through a process of activating all of these different um, uh, plasma factors that all go by Roman numeral. Um, I don't really understand the history behind who came up with this Roman numeral system or why it is the way it is. It's very confusing, but they all have a Roman numeral. And once each of those individual um, plasma factors have, clotting factors have been activated, then that Roman numeral gets an A with it to designate that it's been activated. Um, so the system of giving it the Roman numeral is based on how they were discovered. <coughs> it's not necessarily that's when it's activated and comes into play into the cascade, but it's very confusing because you want to put it in order of the Roman numeral, but that's not how it goes. Um, the Generation, uh, you go through three stages of the coagulation. You have the thromboplastin activity, the thrombin activity, and the fibrin to fibrinogen. The last major step is the fibrinolysis, which is breaking down that clot once it's formed. So these are all of your platelet uh, coagulation factors. I do not expect you to know them. I just want you to see that they each come into play um, at different times. And so if you have a defect in one of these, if you're not producing one of them, like Von Willebrand's, then something like this can be known as like Von Willebrand's factor, Leighton, um, Christmas factor. So if you're missing the inability to produce this one, then they would call that like a Christmas factor or Christmas disease or something like that. Um, and then you also <coughs> have other things that are important. Um, so these are just a list of some of those. And again, we talked about that. Um, oh, it's not on here. Vitamin K is not on here, I don't think, but vitamin K is also essential in your coagulation as well. So what will happen is you get a tissue injury, 
and then your platelets are called to the scene. Your platelets recognize that collagen. And then you have two pathways that are going to be activated when the platelets send out those signals. And I'm not expecting you to know these pathways. Just know that there are pathways, two pathways, intrinsic and extrinsic. Once those do their job, they both come down here to this factor X and they activate it. And then that goes into the common pathway. So they both have their own factors that work in each pathway until it gets to factor X and then that's the common pathway. And it goes all the way down to the thrombin and the fibrinogen to create that final step in the coagulation. And again, this is talking about the intrinsic pathway. One activates the next, and then that one activates the next. So it's kind of like a system of dominoes where you've got to have the first one fall before the next one will fall and the next one to fall. And so with each of those being activated, if even one of those is missing or not working like it should, then as you can see from this last slide, if something in here is not activated and this system doesn't work, this is not gonna happen. If this domino is gone, if it's not there or not working to a point to be activated, it's never gonna get to this step. So you're not gonna form that plug that last fibrin clot. So some of the tests <coughs> that we use to test the intrinsic pathway is the APTT. And so this I do want you to know as far as which test to test which pathway. So your APTT is going to test your intrinsic pathway. And that's going to measure the factors that are within the intrinsic pathway. But it's also going to measure your common pathway because it's got to get all the way through to make that plug. And this kind of shows you that um, these factors each activates the other. It's very complicated. Uh, you will learn this in hematology, so I don't expect you to know it now. Um, you can see calcium comes into play. You will actually do a PT test, which tests the extrinsic pathway. You'll get to do this in lab in the tube. So you actually get to see this clot formed inside the tube. And again, you have one thing that activates the next, that activates the next. And then in the end, it's going to lead to that uh, clot that you're looking for. And that's just another picture of that pathway being activated. And when either of those paths have been activated, it's going to go all the way through activating factor X and that common pathway. And then it's going to go all the way down until it activates um, to form that last clot, that sustainable, durable clot that um, is going to keep everything in the place to allow that healing process. <clears throat> so your fibrin clot, once it's formed and clot retraction. So once that fibrinogen is converted to fibrin, you'll get that visible clot, which is um, formed loosely over the injury, which is kind of reinforcing that platelet plug and finally doing that final seal over top of that injury. And then over time, that clot starts to retract and becomes a little bit smaller, smaller, smaller. Because as your tissue is healing, that clot's not needing any, needed anymore. Um, you know, if you've ever pulled off a scab, um, you know, after it's been healed for a few days, you pull it off, the hole is not as big as it used to be. So sometimes that scab may still bleed a little bit. So it depends on, you know, how much of that uh, fibrin clot is still there. <coughs> um, the normal clot retraction in vitro is 
um, should be in vitro. Uh, you can actually do the testing process of the retraction of that clot. And that's, that's a test that's done, um, completed at four hours over 37 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure how many places really do this anymore, um, but there are testing mechanisms for it. Uh, fibrinolysis is the breakdown of that clot. And um, as soon as the clotting process has begun, fibrinolysis is initiated to break down the fibrin clot that was formed. Um, active enzymes that is responsible for digesting the fibrin or fibrinogen or in the plasmin. Um, plasmin is not normally found circulating in the blood, but it is present in an inactivated form, which is plasminogen. So once that plasminogen is activated, then it turns into an enzyme that will start breaking down um, that process. So it will um, break down the products of the fibrin and fibrinogen, which is actually called the fibrin degradation products or the split products. Those are removed from the blood and um, the, by the mononuclear phagocytic system. And then as those products break down of the fibrin, then D-dimer results um, when those products have been stabilized by those additional factors. <coughs> Um, so your body has a natural way to protect against um, your body actually forming clots when it shouldn't. So some of those things that help um, to prevent clots from forming is normal blood flow. Um, the reason why you see people have strokes is when their heart is not functioning the way it should, sometimes it's not... Um, able to push blood through the heart chambers like it should. So what will happen is the blood will kind of pull up in a heart chamber and start to kind of become stagnant. And a clot will form in a stagnant area, like in an upper chamber of the heart. You can see this with people that like have a AFib um, when that top chamber is not pumping like it should. So when that blood starts to pull up, and starts to clot, it'll form a clot. And then when that clot circulates through the body, then it may get to a vessel like in the brain. And that's where the stroke comes from. So as long as blood flow is normal, it's constantly moving, then you're not as, um, you're not at risk for stroke. <coughs> um, Another mechanism that the body uses is to remove factors that have been activated or any kind of particulate matter, anything that's like left over from um, any sort of clot. And then you also have natural anticoagulants within your system. And so there's a list of some of those there, like the protein C, the protein S. And then you also have cells that kind of regulate um, the body's mechanisms for clotting. And then if a patient is at risk for developing clots, um, then what, what they can do is be put on therapeutic medications to help prevent those clots. Um, so there are a lot of them out there that have been developed over the years. Um, the warfarin, the heparin. So those are some of the old school ones that have been used. <coughs> There's a lot of newer medications, um, stuff like warfarin. Warfarin was um, worked against vitamin K. So patients that took this medication um, they were told to avoid diets that were affected by the vitamin K. I mean, diets that were high in vitamin K, so like the acidic juices, um, leafy greens. Like if you've ever had anybody that was um, 
an elderly person that you knew that said, you know, they couldn't have salads and things like that. It's because they were high in vitamin K. And if they were on warfarin, then adding the vitamin K in just kind of contradicted the act of the warfarin. So they had to avoid things like that. Some of the newer medications um, aren't an antagonist against vitamin K. They work by other methods. So those, um, the restrictions, Restrictions of diet have um, have lessened for most of the patients now. <clears throat> Some of the screening tests that can be done to check coagulation and hemostasis is like we had mentioned, some of the platelets function test. Um, there are different platelet function tests out there. There are some really old school methods of testing platelet functions um, by doing like a bleeding time. And then there are some newer methods. And of course we have the PT, PTT, which tests the, um, to see what clotting factors are available. And you guys will get to practice the PT in lab. And again, this is just referring to um, the PT, PTT test, some of those other tests. Um, <clears throat> when you're collecting a sample for these tests, you need to make sure that the sample is a quality sample. So anything that you do to the lab, the results are only as good as the specimen. So if you have a specimen that is not a quality specimen, then you're going to see a potential for errors. So things that can cause errors, especially for like a PT or PTT, is if the sample is contaminated with anything, including something like tissue thromboplastin. Um, if you see, you're mostly going to see something like this if there's um, a lot of fluid or if it's a finger stick and there's like excessive squeezing. Um, if there's contact with an inappropriate specimen container. So in other words, you're not following the order of draw. So this PT tube is supposed to be collected early on in that blood draw. But if you wait and collect it at the end, then it could be contaminated by something that was um, on the, that was within one of the tubes before it. So for example, your potassium EDTA which is your hematology tube, that purple tube, could still be on that needle from that collection device. So when you pop the next tube on, then some of that potassium could contaminate the tube that follows. Um, the use of inappropriate anticoagulants. So of course, if a patient is taking aspirin, um, that's gonna affect the platelet function. You know, there are certain tests that the physician may tell the patient to stop a medication before the test is done. <clears throat> Any technique that could produce hemolysis. So um, if the blood flow is really slow and you use a really small needle on a patient, then that slowing could cause um, some hemolysis into that tube. So the phlebotomist needs to be very aware of things that could be affecting the drawing of that tube. Um, the inappropriate ratio for your PT tubes, if you draw not enough or you overfill a tube, that can also affect it. Improper storage, improper specimen processing, not spinning the tube down in appropriate time, things like that can affect your sample quality. So you're using a sodium citrate tube for your coag test with a one to 10 ratio. So those tubes come pre-filled with the sodium citrate in the tube. This is something that's gonna be hounded to you throughout your career. Um, throughout school is about that ratio. If that ratio is off, if that tube is not properly filled, it will affect those results because you're having too much or too little um, of that anticoagulant in that tube. 
um, some limitations of the test, which is similar to like your hematology as well. If the specimen is clotted, you know, of course, if it's clotted, your coag factors are going into the process of making that clot. So if they're in the process of making that clot, then they're not going to be readily available for you to, um, to test when you're actually running that test. So it could actually skew your results. The sample's hemolyzed, icteric, lipemic. These are a lot of factors that could affect that test process. Okay, that is it for coagulation, hemostasis.